Hey, it's Scott Petrick with another episode of the Brown Zone Zone Coverage Podcast. The NFL Draft is here, even if the Browns will once again be late to join the party. The first round begins tonight, and the Browns aren't scheduled to pick until number 54 on Friday night. Will General Manager Andrew Barry trade down again? Will he pick a receiver? Here to discuss the options, as always, is Dave Chodowski of Go, the WKYC Morning News. What's going on, Chud? I'll tell you what's going on, Scott. Cleveland sports right now, I mean, if the Browns had a first-round pick, we'd really be buzzing. Uh, that obviously, you know, them not being the first round takes a lot of luster out of it. But you got the Guardians hot right now. They play, and we're taping this Thursday morning. They play Boston yeah. at 110. Uh, you know, I know they lost last night, but, boy, they're off to an amazing start. You got the Cavs in the playoffs tonight. And, you know, regardless, Browns draft is always – you know, big, and that's why we talk about it, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not as big as it could be. It's not the Super Bowl like it usually is, but still, everyone wants to uh, know what they're going to do over uh, the next few days here. Yeah, I I'm with you, Chad. Like, it, we've talked about it. It's hard to have the same buzz, right, and the same hype about it. Um, even from my perspective, you know, I wrote less and not, you know, completely. I wrote, you know, it's not like I ignored it. Um, we wrote Dr. Andrew Barry. I've been writing um, features on some guys I think they could pick. I wrote a feature about a local guy looking at potential candidates in the second and third round for some positions of quote unquote need. Um, but there's just not the same interest. And, and that just makes all the sense in the world, right? That they're not picking in the top five. They don't need a quarterback. Um, all those things that got would get fans excited um, for many years, right? That's, changed and I, and I think it's it's not only not having a number one pick I think part of it is if you have success then the draft feels less important right so the Browns are coming off a playoff trip um it feels like the roster set you don't look at this as this kind of do or die event right um yeah. it'll be interesting you know like I, I would assume people in Baltimore or Kansas City feel the same way like I don't and I don't know this this is just my assumption that the draft is not a doer, or a, you know, it's not a huge event in Kansas City on a yearly basis because they're winning Super Bowls and picking 32nd, right? So I think it just kind of speaks to the changing state of the franchise. Yeah, no question. Um, I, I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I don't think we'd be doing our job if we didn't. Is there any chance the Browns can trade into the first round? Well, I mean, there's a chance they could. I mean, they have the possibility, right? They could trade next year's first rounder and whatever, extra picks to do that. Um, but I, I put the chance at like, you know, 0.2%. Like, it's just not going to happen. Um, there's been no discussion of it. We're, the media is not even on like on high alert. You know, the first couple of years, this is the third year in a row, right? Without the first round pick because of the Sean Watson trade. Um, the first couple of years, we are kind of on alert, like, hey, maybe something could happen. Um, now it feels like, you know, we're into this routine and, you know, I'll have my laptop ready, but I certainly don't expect anything to happen. And, you know, the main reason is it would just take a lot. And I think when you get to this point, um, Andrew Barry's looking forward to having that first round pick next year. And he doesn't have a ton of picks this year, right? So it's it's hard. He would have to mortgage the future. He'd have to mortgage – give up more draft picks, and he's just not in a position, I don't think, to do that because he doesn't have a lot of picks um, this year. And, you know, I, I think he wants to get back to normalcy, so to speak, yeah. and have a full draft, have a number one pick. And, and so I don't think he's going to get into that. You would you would just have to totally have a game-changing player that you absolutely love that felt could just come in and – take you to that next level, I would assume, in, in order to, to jump into the first round right, right. now. Right, and, like, who, who would that player be, right? It's easy to envision that for a quarterback, right? Let's say they needed a quarterback and they loved Michael Penix Jr. from Washington and they thought they could get him at 30. Um, then maybe you come up with a plan to move up 24 spots, right? Like, I could see that. But are you moving to, you know, you move in 24 spots, which means – I, you know, and I don't have the chart in front of me, but let's just say that next year's one and next year's three or whatever, right, to move up 24 spots. Um, 
are you doing that for the fourth best corner? Are you doing that for the seventh best ta- offensive tackle? Right? Like who would, or the sixth best receiver, right? Like who would get you to do that? Um, I, I, just, I just don't think there's that guy out there. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I asked the question because if anything, I think it's interesting for fans to hear that you're not on high alert and that you have been in the past. I mean, that's a little nugget there. I mean, to know that, you know, you kind of have a hint towards it and you're not on alert at all for tonight. Yeah. So yeah. that, that, that kind of tells fans a lot, I think. Yeah, hopefully I'm not wrong about that. But no, I mean, it just <laughs> it just doesn't like I've got no sense that anything's going to happen. And I just like I said, I just don't think that's I just think it's feasible this year. Yeah, no doubt. So the Browns have uh, six picks, right? Uh, rounds two, three, five, six and two in the seventh. Is that correct? Chud, I'm glad you asked that. I just called it up to make sure I wasn't screwing that up. Um, yes. That's correct. Second round, third right, round. I... Um, fifth, six, two. No, they got two sevens. So three, yeah, yeah I, I've looked yeah, at it yeah, three yeah, times. Yeah. Yeah, I've, looked, six <laughs> I've looked at it three times because they made a trade recently that kind of changed it up. And you got to be careful if you Google certain places. I, I thought I saw somewhere it said they don't have a fifth round pick, but I, I'm pretty sure they have a fifth round pick. But, yeah, they do. Um, it's it's um <laughs> it's from Philly via Arizona. I think it's the Josh Dobbs trade um, Mm -hmm. last preseason. So, yeah, I mean, this is straight from the Browns' preseason draft release, so I'm assuming they got it right. Yeah. So they have no first-round pick, no fourth-round pick, and a big gap between three and five. Yeah. Number 85 to number 156. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big gap. And then they have the two seventh-round selections. I I have to feel – what do you think the percentage is that – and I, we'll get to the second-round pick here in a second because I have a feeling I – well, I know how you feel because I, I saw what you wrote. <laughs> um, but percentage that Andrew Barry makes a deal in this entire draft, regardless oh. of what round. Oh, Chad, I would percent. go high on that. I'd go like I, – I might go 75% on that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. He's just so aggressive so, in history <laughs> – He's gonna he's gonna do something. So there you have it. That that's pretty high. So what we just talked about there, that will change because he'll right. probably trade away one or if not both the seventh round picks. Um that's a possibility. Yep. Um or he'll yeah, I mean I guess the bottom line is you have no idea to get more picks for this year, get more picks for the future. Um so let's ask you this question then. When they're on the clock. And that would so they have no picks tonight. Right. And if you're not familiar with the draft now, and I'm I'm sure most listeners are, but first round is tonight, second and third Friday night, four through seven on Saturday, correct? Correct. All right. So first pick for the Browns is second round. It's pick fifty-four tomorrow night, correct? Yep. All right. Do they pick it fifty-four or do they trade that pick? I think they trade it. Um, and there's a couple reasons I think that one that he's traded the second round pick the last two years. Um, you know, one was to move down in the draft in 2022. He just to get extra picks last year, he moved down from the second to third round to trade for Elijah Moore. He did that heading into the draft, but he still gave up that second round pick. Um, so there's a history philosophically, they just believe in having more picks, right? Like, the more picks you have, the more bites at the apple, the better off you are. And I think that holds true on a large scale, philosophically. I think this year, with the gap we talked about, not having a fourth-round pick, I think part of the Browns wants to acquire a fourth-round pick. Um, so one way to do that is trading back from 54. Um, it's the best asset they have, right, it's sitting there at 54. So... Um, I would expect them to move back, maybe not out of the second round, but if you move back, you know, 54 to, well, you know, the second, actually, that's you're probably only have about 10 picks there left in the second round. So maybe they move to the top of the third round and they get an extra fourth, or they get a fourth round pick. I could see that. You go from 54 to 68, let's say, um, and then you pick up a fourth rounder. I think that's, I don't know, highly unlikely, but 
I think it's likely I would expect personally Andrew Bear to make that trade. And just real quick, we talk about the lottery, right? And how it's a crapshoot. We all know that. But I think sometimes we, we lose sight of just how much of a crapshoot the draft is. And I was reading a story about, you know, this deep dive, like, thesis that these college people did. And just talking about that, how it's all and not it's random, but the point is there's a bunch of misses in the draft. And that doesn't change. It never changes. And if you look at it over a large scale of time, you know, there's a bunch of misses. And I saw ESPN, one of their analysts, put out or research people, put out a tweet the other day talking about the hits in the first round and how they called it a hit was if you got a second contract with your original team, right? Okay, that's one way to quantify it. That's fine. And it was staggering the amount of misses in the first round. Like, center, it was funny because centers, if you picked a center in the first round, you had a really high hit rate. Um and then every other, I think it was every other position might have been under 50% hit rate as far as does that guy get a second contract? And I just thought that's fascinating. And, it, and we lose sight, I think, during a draft that, oh, my gosh, I love this player, right? Player X, you got to get him. Well, the reality is the chances of player X hitting is probably 50-50. And that's at best. And that's if you're picking, like, in the top 10 of the draft. And it gets lower, the you know, the the, the percentage of a success decreases the deeper you get in the draft. So my point is you're better off getting as many picks as possible. Um, and, and the Browns highly believe it. I'm looking at that stat now. It was centers a 92% hit rate. Offensive tackles, 59%. Guards, 50 Every other position was under 50%. So... Mm-hmm you're better off with as many picks as possible. And I think it bugs fans because it delays gratification and you move down and you move down. But that makes a lot of sense. How do teams like the Steelers then are so successful in the in the draft? The Ravens yeah. are also usually pretty good. And I'm not going to name all the teams. But, sure. you know, is it when, when, you, when you look at things like that and you think it's more luck than anything, or is it talent evaluators? Like, yeah. How do you become successful in the draft? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I, I'm I'm not taking I'm not taking the talent evaluation out of the equation because I think that matters, right? And I think some people are better at is talent evaluators, right? Ozzie Newsom was a really good talent evaluator with the Ravens, but he wasn't perfect. And I think if you if you looked over the entire Ravens drafting history. There's plenty of misses, right? They haven't been able to draft a receiver. I mean, maybe um, it's Zay Flowers, right? The guy they drafted last year. Maybe that changes it for them. But for years, they tried to draft receivers, and they kept getting them wrong. And they were taking them in the first and second rounds. Um, so I, I think maybe our perception of Pittsburgh and, and Baltimore and whoever else is considered really good drafters, I think maybe it's skewed because you focus on when they get picks right. Um, and the reality is they're getting a bunch of picks wrong. You know, I mean, Bill Belichick is one of the smartest people to ever be in the NFL. And he's, when it was in his charge, the draft, he had a lot of misses, right? And it's not just Mac Jones. I mean, it, it, this has going, been going on for a while. So um, I, I think the right talent evaluator certainly helps. Uh, but I think volume is more important. Now, Where that becomes a balance and where you have to juggle it is the hit rate gets worse as you go down. So, you know, let's, and I'm strong out numbers. Let's say you have a 38% chance of hitting at 54 and a 29% chance of hitting at 66, right? Well, so then you're better off sticking at 54, right? Like you can have that discussion and that's where the analytics and that is where the data comes in. Um, And, you know, it's the same way in the first round, like the, the, more impactful players come higher. And that that kind of trends out over time too, right? So you are better off picking high in the draft, um, but even that's not a guarantee. So that's why it's so complicated. That's why it's so hard. And that's why it can't – yes, the draft is hugely important, but we've seen the Browns build their roster other ways, right? If they haven't had a first-round pick the last two years. They won't have one this year, yet the roster is probably as good as it's ever been because Andrew Barry has used some draft picks to make trades for Amari Cooper, 
for Jerry Judy, right? Um, for Zanary Smith. So you have to be creative and you can't just rely on the draft. And obviously that's best because guys are cheaper and other just certainly benefits from the draft and you want to build that way. Um, but you have to kind of have these multi-tiered ways of building your roster um, because because the draft is just hard. I guess that's what I I guess that's my bottom line. It's just hard. Um, it, it's just hard to draft. Yeah. All right. Before I ask you who the player they will get in the second round or what their first pick is, we'll get to that in a second. Just highlight what are the Browns' needs heading into this draft? Yeah. There's not a glaring one, Chud, which is what makes picking, forecasting who they might pick more difficult. I think we also have to look at the Browns believe in, everybody says take the best player available, right? Um, but it's harder to do that sometimes. But it's easier to do when you have a roster that you feel is really strong and across the board that the Browns feel that, and I feel like there's no huge need on this roster. So they don't have to be forced into any into taking any position. And that, I think that helps, right? It gives you a ton of flexibility. It allows you to move up and down. allows you to not chase a certain position, chase a certain player. Um, but they also believe in building for the future, right? And this draft is not just about 2024. It's about 25 and 26 or 27. Um, and, and that will factor into, you know, some of the positions they go after, some of the players they go after. Having said that, if I still have, I still think it's important to look at potential needs. And I would rank them uh, – I'd go receiver. I think they still need a receiver. I'd go D-tackle. Um, I think they need a young D-tackle to add to that mix because there's a lot of older guys in that D-tackle group. And then perhaps their biggest need right now, right, if the season started tomorrow, would be a number two tight end. Um, you have David Njoku. He's a pro bowler. And then, to me, there's a pretty big fall-off until Jordan Akins, and then they sign Giovanni Ricci, who's more of a blocker than a receiver. I, I think they need a number two tight end. Um, we you know, we can argue about the importance of that position versus a receiver D-tackle, but to me, those three stand out. Now, you it's interesting. Uh, I've been on this site, and they have odds each team as to what position will be their first pick. Yeah. And uh, I put this out on a tweet earlier, and it's got number one, it, it goes D-line edge plus 175, wide receiver plus 250, offensive lineman plus 310, cornerback plus 600, lineback plus 900. And then they go on to the rest of th – those are the first five. Yeah, that's interesting, Chud. I think a lot of that is based on importance of that position, right? Re defensive end is a premium position. Receiver is a premium position. Um, you can talk call offensive line if it's we're talking about tackles, a premium position. Corner back is certainly a premium position. And the Browns will always tend to draft those positions. Uh, so I understand those odds. Um, but I do want to have a quick discussion on that because you brought a tackle. And I keep hearing the Browns could be interested in an offensive tackle, right? And I'm having a hard time getting my head around that just because they have Dewan Jones, who they drafted last year. He feels like he's going to be, you know, a starting tackle here for years down the line. They have Jack Conklin, and we know he's getting older. He's coming off injuries. So he's not, you know, he might start this year, right, if he's coming back from the knee and they have to figure that out. They have three candidates for two spots. Um but then they have Jedrick Wills Jr. And he's entering the last year of his contract. Um, but he's a, you know, they drafted a number 10 in 2020. I've never gotten the sense that they're ready to give up on him. Now they got to figure out contractually what's going to go on there. And maybe if they draft a tackle early, right? If they stay 54 and draft a tackle, to me, that's a signal that Jedrick Wills will not be here long term and maybe won't even be here this year, right? That they decide to move on from him. Um, but I've never gotten that sense inside the organization. I kind of feel like Wills and Jones could be the two guys moving forward. So um, I've struggled to tackle. Like I've kind of ignored tackle, um, but I keep seeing, you know, I keep seeing it coming, come up, come up, come up. So maybe 
maybe I'll be wrong. And I just want to say that if they do take a tackle relatively high, right? Because he take a tackle 54, the assumption is he's going to be a starter. Maybe not day one, but within the first year or two, right? That's what happens when you draft a tackle that high. Um, I think it would signal the end for Jedrick Wills at some point. Some people, like a bunch of fans would be happy with that. Um, I like Wills more than a lot of people do. I've always thought the Browns liked him more than the fan base does. Um, so I think that would kind of trigger a shift in thinking within the organization. Bottom line is, uh, you said wide receiver would be your, that would be your number one guess? Yeah, I well, yeah, I think that's, I think it's in the top three need. Um, and I say that, and if you talk about 54, um, or let's say whatever, they make the first pick, right? I actually took Mason Smith at D-tackle out of LSU. That's my in my mock draft. But you could talk me into receiver easily because it's a really deep receiver draft class. Amari Cooper and Elijah Moore are in the last year of their contracts. And Cedric Tillman, David Bell, Michael Woods a second. Like, those guys are unproven still. Um, so I, I think those are all reasons why – They'll, I think they'll take a receiver relatively high, and it could be with the first pick they make. Okay. All right, Scott Petrak, you're Andrew Barry. You're on the clock, whether it's at 54 in the second round or, you know, they trade and whatever their first pick is, who's the player? Who is it? And I, I know this is a needle in the haystack, <laughs> but this is why we do this. Yeah. Let's see if, let, let's see if you can hit. Who, who will the Browns pick? Yeah, I'm going to go – LSU defensive tackle Mason Smith. And I talked about, right, so they have Dalvin Thomason, but he's 30. They have Maurice Hurst, he's 28. They have Shelby Harris, he's 32. They signed Quentin Jefferson, he's 31. Right, they're getting up there it, along the D tackle spot. I think in Jim Schwartz's scheme, we saw an added emphasis placed on defensive tackle within the organization. Um. And that was obvious when they went and spent big money on Davin Tomlinson last year. Uh, they were interested in defensive tackles and free agency this year. They didn't spend the big money, right? Christian Wilkins, they were interested. The price got too high. But I, I think that just shows you how much they value that position now is maybe opposed to a couple years ago. And so having said all that, Mason Smith's a guy I talked to at the Combine. I really enjoy talking to him. He's a big body. He's 6'5". I like that from a defensive tackle. Uh, I talked to two of his two people from LSU. I wrote a story about him this week. It's on brownzone.com. And I believe he has big upside because, first of all, he's a huge, like he was a number one recruit in Louisiana. Like he's a huge recruit, had a good freshman year at LSU, then tore his ACL in the opener of his sophomore year, missed the rest of the season, wasn't quite the same last year, got better as the year went on. They had like, he went through like 10 defensive line coaches at LSU because there's a bunch of instability. So I, I think he, his best is yet to come. I think he's got tremendous upside. I like his character. I think he fits, you know, quote unquote need. I think he'll be there around when the Browns are picking whenever they, you know, if it's at 54, even, even if they move down. Um, and I think they need a young difference maker on that D line. And maybe Siaki Ike is that guy. They drafted him in the third round a year ago. But he didn't show me enough last year. And um, I, I think they could use a young guy at that position. And there won't be a ton of pressure for him to play right away because of the veterans. And, and so I like that guy, and I like the spot for him. So if they draft Mason Smith or a wide receiver, you've hit a home run. Okay. Does that, does that work? Yes. Yeah, and if they draft an offensive tackle, then I struck out swinging. <laughs> All right, here's another guy that you think could possibly land on on the Browns is uh, Cade Stover from Ohio yeah. State, tight end. Yeah, and we talked about how I thought they have a, a, a need at that number two spot, and I think he fits it. He's a receiver. He can catch the ball. Um, you know, I talked to his tight end coach um, at Ohio State, Keenan Bailey, and he said, hey, people who question in the NFL keep asking me about, you know, his route running wow. and his ability as a receiver. He was, we had a great receiver room, right, which they always do at Ohio State. They had Marvison Harrison Jr. And Stover's like their second receiver. So he's pr been productive that way. 
He's a willing blocker, and he gets upset. Like, pro football focus graded him poorly as a blocker. And Stover got upset at the combine talking about it, like defensive. And so did Bailey when I talked about to him. He said, he goes, we put together a game plan. He goes, for example, we're playing Penn State, and Penn State's got edge rushers. He said, how are we going to block? And he goes, Kate's our number one blocker. We put him on their defensive end, and that's how we're going to win this game. He goes, no. He goes, the other tight ends in this draft were not asked to do the same thing. And he talked about Bowers. He talked about Sanders from Texas. Bowers is going to go in the top 10 probably, the kid from Georgia. So they don't think that blocking grade was was legitimate, right? Um, they disagree with it completely. So my point is he's a dual capability tight end. He can catch. He can block. He gives you flexibility. He's a Mansfield kid. Um, I, you know, I love his story. He gets so passionate talking about life on the farm. He's just looking to play in the NFL to go back to Mansfield and run the family farm. Uh, he majored in agriculture. Like, they call him Farmer Grant. And I'm sure a lot of Ohio State fans know this, but I'm not a huge, huge Ohio State guy. So I didn't know all this background about him. Um I, I, so I think he's a character guy. I think he fits. He's a captain. I think he's a two-time captain in Ohio State. The Browns like to draft captains. So I think he fits. I think he could be there in the third round. I, I think it would make a lot of sense. All right. Let's um, highlight uh, a receiver. Uh, did you mention uh, Corley yet? No. And here's the thing about – I like Corley, and I wrote about him, and that's another story on Browns on um, – He's a Debo Samuel, right? It's easy to throw these comps. That's what you do, the comparisons. That what you, that's what you do at draft time. Um, but the body type is similar to Debo Samuel. He's like a running back when he gets the ball in his hands. And he played running back a lot in high school. Uh, he's like, I think he's just under six foot, like 220-ish. Like he's a big, thick receiver. Um, and he gives you that run after catch. Like he calls himself the Yak King. Um because he's got a ton of yards after catch. He runs guys over. He runs away from them. He, he's really good with the ball in his hands. It's a lot of, you know, in it, it Western Kentucky, it was a lot of screens, a lot of, you know, he ran reverses. It was shallow crosses. So he didn't have, you know, this complicated route tree. He didn't go deep a ton, but he did some. Um, so there's, so he's not like this perfect prospect, right? He's not 6'4". He doesn't run a 4'4". Four, four, but there's a lot to like about him. I think he fits. I think he gives the Browns a dimension that they don't have. You know, kind of what they tried to do with Elijah Moore last year, but it didn't really work. You know, getting him the, you know, putting him in the backfield, kind of handing him the ball, running bubble screens. And I think Corley would be better in that area than Moore. He's a thicker, bigger body. Um, so I like him. Um, I, I think he's an interesting candidate. Again, he could be there at 54 and even a little bit later. He's a second, third round area is when he's expected to be picked. Um, so I like a, a lot about him, but there's a ton of receivers, right? So like you start looking at candidates and, you know, I wrote about Corley cause I thought he was interesting and I think there's a chance the Browns could take him, but you know, you, you start looking at mock drafts and you look at Dane Brugler's list of receivers, right? And there's a ton of them like Xavier Leggett, who could go early. Um, earlier than the Browns pick out of South Carolina. Like, I like him a lot. And then I started watching video of him, and I really liked him. Um, Troy Franklin of Oregon. Uh, he flies. He had 14 touchdowns. Um, not a perfect prospect. But, you know, you're not getting somebody perfect in the second round. But we've seen a lot of second-round receivers blow up in the NFL and turn in to absolute studs, right? Xavier Worthy, he ran a blister in combine, the 40 at the combine. 4.21, best ever. I don't think he makes it to the second round, but some mock drafts have him hanging around. So there's just a long list of guys that could be in the mix. And maybe if a bunch of those guys are still there, then Andrew Barry has even more reason to trade down because he believes 15 picks later, he can still get one of that cluster of receivers. Mm -hmm. Corley's out of Western Kentucky, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Boy, when you say Debo Samuel, man, that opens up my ears for sure. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's you know, and I asked his coach about that. I said, you know, is that fair? He goes, well, it's never fair to compare these guys, you know, these college guys who've never played in the league to a pro bowler like Debo. He goes, but that's the easiest one to make. Like, that's the easiest comparison to make is to Debo. And Corley went on uh, Steve Smith Jr. has a – or Steve Smith Sr. has a YouTube show, podcast kind of thing. And they talked about him about – 
Corley being the Yak King, and Steve Smith said crown him because he watched enough tape that he's like, yeah, this guy's unbelievable with the ball in his hands. And you also highlighted a, a local kid, right? Yeah. So, you know, and I always – it's usually there's a guy every year, right, or maybe want more than one guy that's, you know, local kid, Lorraine County kid um, that's trying to get in the draft. And sometimes you know they're going to get drafted. Sometimes it's a long shot. Um, so this year it's Michael Dowell. And went to St. Ed's. He's from North Ridgeville. Um, started his career at Michigan State with his two older brothers. He had two – his twin older brothers. They all played at Michigan State. They left. He graduated. He transferred down to Miami of Ohio and become, became an integral part of their defense. They had, like a, they had a really good defense. They won the MAC championship. Anyway, he's a guy that could get drafted at the bottom of the, you know, day three, Saturday, you know, late in the draft. He could get drafted or he could sign somewhere as an undrafted free agent. It certainly feels like he's going to get a chance, right? Some guys have the dream and they never get their chance, so they get a tryout and that's it. It feels like Dowell, if he doesn't get drafted, will sign somewhere, you know, like right after the draft, become one of those priority free agents. And I say that because he, he didn't go to the combine, but he was coming off a broken leg. He broke his leg, his fibula in the MAC championship, didn't need surgery, but missed some, you know, like workout time. Tries to ramp up, goes to his pro day, and he runs a 4-5-240. And he said he could have, you know, he said he thought he'd run even better. He thinks he's faster than that. Um, he he bench pressed. He put up 24 reps on the bench, which is 225, which would have been the best among safeties. He's a strong safety. Best among safeties at the combine. He, he broad jumped 10-4, which would have been like seventh at the combine. The 40 time would have been top 10 at the combine. So he had these, num these testing numbers that would have put him – in among the top guys in the safety class. Um, that's at his pro day. There were a bunch of NFL teams there. The Seahawks had him out to Seattle for a, one of those pre-draft 30 visits. He worked out for the Niners. He worked out for the Bengals. He's gotten calls from other teams. He said he interviewed with the Buccaneers, the Eagles. So there's a, there's legitimate interest in what, I, what also gives him a huge edge, in my opinion. His brother, Andrew, is on the Saints. And he made his way as an undrafted guy um, the Cowboys signed him, wind up cutting him. He winds up landing with the Saints, spends time on the time on the practice squad, then becomes a core special teamer for the Saints. So you have that NFL, you know, those bloodlines, right? Um, teams know his name. They see the brother's work ethic. The, Michael Dowell works crazy hard. That's what his coaches say. So he he's a guy that if you're an NFL GM, why wouldn't you give this guy a chance, right? He could come in, he could play safety. He's going to, you assume he's going to contribute right away on special teams and have an impact there. We know special teams are going to be even more important given the new kickoff rules. There's going to be no, more returns. He's the kind of guy who could help you there um, from a coverage standpoint on special teams. So I think he's going to get a shot. Um, I enjoy talking to him. I enjoy talking to his coach that uh, that story got posted this morning. Um, and it's just nice to see, you know, Cleveland and Akron, right? They all have, there's guys every year, you know, Tommy Eichenberg, right? The Westlake Ignatius kid. Um, he's going to get drafted at some point. Uh, but this is a Lorraine County kid. Um, and, you know, I think he's going to get a shot in the NFL. All right. You got to love it when those local guys, you know, come through. How, how many total local guys do you think there there will be? Man, if you if you if you talk Northeast Ohio, right? I, yeah. I mean, I, we're, I think we probably put that number at, I don't know, more than five, right? Like, I think between five and ten. Um, and and it, this feels a little bit of a down year. I know sometimes you go to the combine, it feels like it's a bunch of kids from Akron, a bunch of kids from Glenville. Um, but, you know, like Mike Hall, right, from, I guess, Mike Hall Jr. from Ohio State, the D-tackle that could be considered, he could be in that mix for the Browns. Um, he started, he grew up in Cleveland, moved to Streetsboro, played high school in Streetsboro. Um, he's a guy, right? So Stover, you know, if you want to just, you know, expand your area a little bit, um, fits into that mix. So besides Marvin Harrison Jr. <laughs> from Ohio State, and he'll go early, who else in the first round are, are we looking at that's maybe Northeast Ohio or, you know, college ties to the area? Is there, is there anyone else? That's a great I don't think there is, Chud. Um, I'm, go, I'm looking through my mock, and right, that doesn't mean these are the only guys that go to pick. Um, where there's a – Quinian Mitchell from Toledo, um, if we want to count that. Um, 
but I don't think I don't think they're I don't I'm not seeing another guy that jumps out at me. You know, I mean obviously the Buckeyes the Buckeyes will have guys drafted, but yeah, um, but there's a there's a drop off between Marvin Harrison, right? Marvin Harrison could go four. Um you know, he could go four to Cardinals or you know, you know that's probably, that's as high as he'll go. He's not getting out of the top ten, right? We all I think everybody can agree on that. And then there's oh, a drop yeah. to whoever the next um Ohio State guy will be. Um, but yeah, you know, Eichenberg, I talked to him at the Combine. I really enjoyed, um, or I wrote about him at the Combine, you know, an Ignatius kid. So yeah, there'll, there'll be plenty of local guys to keep an eye on, but probably not until we get into Friday night. Yeah, and Harrison could be the best player in the draft when it's all said and done. Right? I mean, he really could be. And, you know, it's interesting draft time. You know, I've talked to people that say Malik Neighbors, the LSU receiver, is more explosive. Um, he could get drafted first. And that could be true. All that could be true, right? And Harrison could still wind up being the best player in this draft, right? Even if he's not the first receiver off the board, um, we all we all saw exactly what he could do. Yeah, no doubt. So, how do you kind of, you know, with the Browns not being in the first round, I, you know, I don't think we, there's too much uh, analyzation we need to do here in the first round. But I don't know. Maybe what's your uh, first five picks? How do you how do you yeah. see the first five going and Anything else with tonight that we should keep our eye on? Yeah, I mean, it's all about the quarterbacks, right? And, and that's not always the case, right? There was a – it was a Kenny Pickett draft, right, two years ago where you had Pickett was the only – right, he went in the first round, right, to the Steelers, and then you'd have another quarterback taken until I think it was Malik Willis in the third round, right? So you have drafts that aren't quarterback dominated, but when you have the quality and the quantity of this year's quarterback class – then it's about the quarterbacks. And who knows, right? None of these guys could turn out to be any good. But you're going to have – I think you're going to have one, two, three, be Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, and Drake May. And then you're going to have J.J. McCarthy at some point, right? Does McCarthy go – does somebody trade up to four to take McCarthy? Maybe. Um, I, you know, I actually have him – Minnesota trade up to five to take McCarthy. Um, then you have Bo Nix. You have Michael Penix Jr. But you could have six quarterbacks in the first round which means it's going to be a lot about the quarterbacks, which that's how this league is, right? Um, it'll be interesting to see what New England does at three. I think they're trying to trade out, but I don't think they're going to get the offer they want. So I think they, I have them staying and taking Drake May. Um, the guy is a quarterback out of North Carolina. Um, you know, then it's about where the, where the receivers go. And it's about offense, right? You look at this draft and, you know, I'm not the draft expert that, you know, Daniel Jeremiah and Field Yates and Matt Miller, all those, you know, the guys you see on TV all the time. But you just look at everything. You look at the mocks. You read things. Um, it's going to be heavy offense in the first round, which I think is exciting because if you're a college football fan, you watch these quarterbacks play. You watch these receivers play, and you know that, right? You watch the tight end out of Georgia, Brock Bowers. It's easy to see those guys and go, hey, I know what he can do versus, you know, Maybe a, it's harder with a corner or whatever. Um, I just think we're going to have a lot of offense. You're going to have a lot of tackles, offensive tackles, get drafted, a lot of receivers, and a lot of quarterbacks. Um, and then you'll have a couple corners, right, a couple edge rushers. But, yeah, I think that's what the, I think that's what the draft's going to be about. And then it's who makes a move, if anybody, to go up and get a quarterback. Does Minnesota do it? Does Denver do it? It feels like Denver's desperate to go get a starting quarterback – um, but do they have, you know, the ammunition, the, the draft picks to go up and get one? Um, Sean Payton, right, their coach, it feels like there's a big sense of urgency. I don't know if they have what it takes. Maybe they just sit um, sit at 12 and take Bo Nix out of Oregon, the quarterback at Oregon. So um, I, I think that's what's going to be interesting to watch. You could have, um, you know, the first six picks could be Harrison and five QBs. It could, right? I think, Chad, I think you, I, I think what's more likely is Harrison and four quarterbacks, right? I think that fifth quarterback probably, Bo okay. Nix, probably doesn't go that high. Um, that's my guess. You know, I mean, obviously he could, but yeah, right? You could see uh, he, this top six picks could be four quarterbacks and two receivers with neighbors and Harrison, right? Is yeah. two first receivers. And then you start yeah. to get the offensive tackles. Um, but yeah, so I think that's I think that's kind of fun. Um, and there's real, I have one more point. I, I just wanted I wrote it down. I didn't want to forget it. Is you start to study and go through all these you know all these draft prospects, and this is not 
this is not so much first round. I think it's as you get deeper into the draft and kind of where the Browns are picking. There's a lot of older players. And part of that's that COVID year, right? Guys got um, an extra year of eligibility. Uh, I mentioned Dowell. Dowell is a six-year guy. Um, you know, now you can transfer. And so there's a lot of older players. And the Browns always kind of shied away from that. They went young. Remember, David and Joker, I don't even think he was 21 when they drafted him. Like, they wanted to go younger. They skewed that way because they felt like it would help the development. And you got a guy who's really coming into his own. Um but I think there's less of those options this year that the whether it's the COVID year, whether it's NIL money, keeping players in college longer, um, it's the draft has gotten older. And I, I think we have to make a little bit of an adjustment when we look because there's not a ton, especially as you get lower in the draft. There aren't a ton of guys that are like 21 and you go, OK, let's take a flyer on this kid. It's a lot of more proven prospects, which might help the quality of play when they come out. Um, but it's just a shift, and it really struck me as I got deeper and deeper into the pool of prospects. So when we talk next week, Scott, and we're looking back, we're going to you know analyze what the Browns did. What is the Browns' dream scenario here in this draft? Man, Chad, it's so funny you say that. I'm trying to come up with something to write today because they're not going to make a pick, um, and I'm going to do the dream scenario. So I'm still working through it, but for me, it starts with trade down from 54, add a fourth round pick. Um, and among your first three picks, D tackle, wide receiver, tight end. So whether that's second, third, or fourth, or you got to, you know, if Andrew Barry jumbles around, however he does it, I think those are the first three spots off the board. And again, it's a little biased toward needs, and I talked about how needs are less important. But I do think those three positions are important. Um, and I, I think that would be an ideal scenario for them. And then I think the second half of that is figure out a way to do something with those two seventh rounders. Andrew Bay does not like drafting in the seventh round. Um, can he put them together and get up into the sixth round? Can he put them together and move um, and pick up a sixth rounder next year, right? Um I, I think that's something to watch because I think the bottom half of this draft or the bottom, bottom of this draft might not be as good. Um, and that's what the, the experts are saying. So if you can kind of move forward into the 2025 draft, I, I think that would be beneficial. All right. Give me the three positions again. D tackle, wide receiver, tight end. All right. That's the dream scenario right there. All right. Yes, well, Maybe you need to get to writing that. I don't know. Is there anything else? <laughs> is there anything else you want to hit here? No, we I, I think we hit goodbye? it, Chad. No, I think we hit it, bud. So, yeah. All right. Well, go Cavs tonight. Yeah. NFL draft, and then we'll see what the Browns do tomorrow night. No doubt. Yep. So thank you, Chad. As I'll excuse me. As always, I love talking. Is as we talked about. There's not the buzz, but it's still it still gets you excited, right? We're into this draft now. The draft starts tonight. Next few days are going to be a lot about the draft. Um, and, and it's fun, right? It's a fun time of year. It's going to let you, your mind wander, let you think about what's coming. Um, think about all the potential for all these players, all these draft picks, right? So I think it's interesting. And then you got to watch what your rivals are doing, right? Watch what the Steelers do. Do they make a big trade? I mean, the Steelers are in the middle of a bunch of rumors. Do they go get trade for Brandon Ayuk? Um, do they take a receiver, right? Like, what do they do? What do the Ravens do? Uh, what do the Bengals do, right? So, um, there's certainly stuff to pay attention to, even if the Browns aren't picking. Wow. Great point there. No doubt. Yep. Cool. Well, thanks. So as always, Chud, I appreciate it. We'll talk next week and we'll recap, um, we'll recap the draft. Right. And then we'll get going. Um, then before you know, it, mini camps will start. The rookies will be in for mini camp and then the off season really gets chugging, but we'll talk next week about what the Browns do in this draft. Um, for now, thank you for listening, everybody. This has been the latest episode of the zone coverage podcast. And you can read all my work at brownzone.com. Thanks.